Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I want to introduce you tonight to a gentleman that I followed for, I think, a decade now. Uh, Gil Penalosa is his name. I had the privilege of uh, meeting him first when he came out to Mississauga at one point in time to talk about uh, a development of Mississauga um, when I was uh, the chairman of the Mississauga City Summit. And uh, you were uh, quite uh, impactful. And then I think you spoke in Brampton as well, uh, a different time, and uh, and we're really talking about how to build uh, cities that would be appropriate for people that were eight years old as well as 80 years old. And maybe we'll touch on that organization that you run. Uh, and then, uh, you know, obviously I've followed your uh, your career in, in urban affairs and, and commentary, and then uh, really quite interested in your run for mayor of Toronto this uh, past fall, which is kind of interesting. Uh, you have been a frequent uh, contributor uh, to different newspapers and uh, and columns and articles and uh, opinion pieces, et cetera. Uh, and you've obviously been very involved in city building, not only in Toronto, but but around the world uh, and in your home country as well. Uh, Gil, I got to ask you, we've got a housing crisis going on in Toronto right now. What would be your solution to our housing situation? Well, I think that we've had a housing crisis because I think that the mayors and council across the GTHA have really done very little uh, on how to solve it. And also, not only Ford, but the previous administration, the Liberals. Uh, and now we have this crisis that actually Ford is mixing with the Green Belt, which have nothing to do. I think this is really, we can talk about it later, but I think that having mixed Green Belt and housing uh, is horrible because we don't need we, we don't need one centimeter. I think that one of the, I think that the way we have been growing in the last 40 or 50 years in, in, in most of Canada and the US is poorly. Is is not good for climate change, is not good for mental health, for physical health, even for economic development. And, and I think we're gonna do it radically different. I hope that post COVID, maybe we were gonna come out of COVID thinking that we need to do things more equitable and more sustainable. But now you talk about housing. Well, housing, yeah. I think that specifically, I think that we should do the following, not only in Toronto, where I run for mayor, um, and actually when I run for mayor in Toronto, I got more votes than any mayor in the GTHA, more than Hamilton and Mississauga and Brampton and so on. So it was in an, an interesting uh, experience going from zero to 100,000 votes in 100 days. But the issue with the house- Congratulations in, uh, in that regard. Huh? And congratulations in that regard. I appreciate you running and I appreciate the uh, the voice that you, uh, the, the opinions that you put forward and the voice that you gave a lot of people that uh, don't uh, don't have a voice too often in municipal affairs. So thank you for that. Thank, I, uh, thanks. And, 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 and that was the idea. I obviously people kept telling me Tory is unbeatable. He has too much money. So, but I wish some of the professional politicians had run. But all of them just playing political games. I don't know, we'll do it in four years, in four years. In four, so I said, okay, I'm gonna run. But specifically in housing, first, I think we need to end with exclusionary uh, housing, the exclusionary zoning. We should allow people anywhere in the GTHA, actually anywhere in any city in Canada to divide their homes as of right. If people has, have a house, they should be able to divide it in four. Uh, I think I call that the renovation revolution. Because one of the things is the, also there's many people that are empty nesters who want to age in place, but now they have a big house and it's too expensive to maintain. But if they were able to split it in four, then all of a the sudden they can live in one of them and rent out the other three. Now, a lot of people would oppose that saying that I don't, I don't want to live beside a boarding house or a rooming house or, you know, a basement apartment uh, where people that, uh, are different than me you want to want to locate well that's tough luck the, the, you know the, 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 the city everybody with taxes will build the, the parks and the schools and the libraries and everything around we need to be generous we're not talking about a boarding house with 20 people we're talking about three units uh that people could uh, live and the reality brian is that any councillor in mississauga or toronto or hamilton they would not be able to live in the houses that they live if they did not own a house today. None of them. Uh, and they get paid very well. So they get paid four times more than the, than the average household income in Canada. So even though they get paid between three and four times more, they could not afford. 
It doesn't make any sense that now we're gonna close the doors to people. Uh, the children of the people living in, in the cities are not, are not mm -hmm. able to afford to live there. But if you split houses in four, they're gonna be able to do it. Obviously not everyone is gonna do it, but let's say in Toronto, if we get 10% of the people doing it, just 10% of the houses, uh, all of this, because it's if people wanna do it, if they don't wanna do it, that's fine. But if they wanna do it, all of a sudden we're gonna get 120,000 additional units. Uh, it's great for the owners because all of a the sudden they're gonna get $36,000, $40,000 a year that right. they were not thinking of all of a sudden this year right. and next say, year uh, and next. You said they have it as right. So uh, they don't need zoning approval. They don't need building permit approval. They don't no, need to go not be, no, because all of the changes are gonna be inside the house. So what I would do is have a city hall, have a one-stop shop where any owner could come and get all the advice, financial, legal, uh, design, and so on, and they could get it. So the owners would benefit tremendously. Even the ones that have children and might not want to do it now, but, they, but know, it's all they, they know the that in the future, someday they will be able to do it. So the but owners benefit. Who's going to do the renovations? Mostly small and medium-sized contractors. So we're going to have thousands and thousands of contractors working. And the renters, now all of a sudden, the renters are going to be able to rent citywide, everywhere. So, so that, that would be a win-win-win. But that's only one part of the housing crisis. The second part, which is where the, most of the units are, is in the, all of the public transit corridors. I think that as of right, we should allow people to densify from six to 12 stories along all of the transit corridors. So in the case of Mississauga, along here, Ontario, and Dundas, and Burnham, and so on, but only five to 12 stories. I'm not talking about 40 or 80 or stories. Uh, by the way, we can get exactly the same density. If we have six stories next to each other, like they do in Paris or Copenhagen or and so on, that if we get 50 or 60 story buildings every other block, except that when you have five to 12 story, it's much more humane, you build much more community. So on this ones, in the case specifically of Toronto, if we did this, whenever we have buses and streetcars, we could have 600,000 units. Plus, where we have LRTs and subways, another 600,000 units, so we could have 1.2 million units. And then we have 30, 30 uh, power centers or shopping centers. Those would not be as all right. Those would, would need to zone, but the whole area at a time, like pr probably one kilometer by one kilometer, then we could get another 300,000 units. And publicly owned lands, we could have another 100,000 units. So we could open up open up space for about 1.8 million units. We only need 10% of that. If we get 10% of that built, we will solve the current crisis and all the housing need for the next 10 years. If we do another 10%, we will have it for, the, for 2050. So we don't need to do, I'm just saying, since the, all of that is owned by the private sector, the private sector might wanna do it or not. But what I'm saying, if 10% if of them did it, we will solve all of the housing crisis in Toronto for the next 10 years. But it's but interesting that you're saying that it's... Saga in Brampton, in Hamilton, and so on. And then uh, we, we, would not, we would have plenty of housing everywhere, and we would, not have, we, we would end with the housing crisis. It's interesting you're saying as of right, uh, uh, other than your power center, uh, shopping center comment. Um, and so if it's as of right, you're effectively saying that the government regulation right now, the government planning uh, department regulation approval process, is it needed? Doesn't work. Exactly. I, I I don't think it works. I think they're they're getting in the middle of the developers. I think we could save the developers two or three years of legal cost and negotiations. Uh, the, here there would not be any negotiations. Nothing. It's according to the width of the road. By the way, a lot of this is being done now in 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 Melbourne in Australia. So Melbourne, the metropolitan area has 5 million people. They're gonna to go to 10 million. So this is how they are doubling the population in the existing footprint. So that is the idea. We should have all of the population growth in Canada within the existing footprint if we really wanna tackle climate change. Uh, so, so this is completely doable. Yes, I totally agree. You, you are correct. We, we would be eliminating a lot of, of the bureaucracy that gets on the way and we would allow with simple rules, similar to Melbourne. 
on the on the first floor has to be retail, small or medium-sized retail. So we don't want to fill that up with shoppers and banks. Uh, second, if you want to have, you don't have, you don't need to have parking. But if you're going to do parking, you can do it underground or on the back. Nothing, no parking on the front. Uh, third, uh, well, then everything else is going to be housing above above the street level. Uh, so there are some basic guidelines, but if you meet those five or six basic guidelines, you save three years of negotiations and expenses, and the, the building is going to be a, a lot faster. Now, in our current system, uh, the planning department would have approval over the number of parking spaces, the number of uh, bike uh, spots, uh, the amount of amenity space per uh, square foot of building, uh, whether that building that you've just uh, allowed to be built uh, produces shade on a single family home that is nearby, et cetera. So you think all of that stuff doesn't uh, need to be uh, part of our regulatory system? Exactly. Uh, by the way, I, I think that what I'm saying, most of the 80% of the NIMBYs and 80% of the YIMBYs would agree. I think we don't have clear guidelines, clear rules. I think what people hate is that every single spot is negotiated. So you go to neighborhoods in Toronto, where in every corner, there is a different guideline. There is a bylaw for this one and one for that one. And people say, oh, you can do only three stories. And then you see eight stories or you see 12. No, 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 no. In the neighborhoods, it would be three stories. Three stories add to six units. So some people, if, you, if there is nothing, or if you want to tear down a house and, and do, you can do three floors, two units per floor. No more than three floors, nobody. So people would, there would be a lot of pressure, even if they want to if they want to take it to legal issues, because all of the community would know that inside the neighborhoods, nothing would be more than three floors. On the arterials, the people hate that they put a 40 or 50 or 60 story on, on an arterial, facing the neighborhood because it has shade, it has a lot of bad issues for them. But if they know that on the arterial, it's gonna be based on the width of the road. So places like Roncesvalles, for example, it's gonna be six stories. Places like Eglinton is gonna be 12 stories. So people have very clear guidelines. And then this is not for lawyers or MBAs. Uh, no, any, any, if you are a dentist, if you are flipping hamburgers, you would understand the guidelines. Everybody would get them. And, 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 and then, because I, I don't think people are tired that all of a sudden they go and they can negotiate with a counselor for, for height. Oh no, it's because they're gonna give us this uh, sculpture or they're gonna give us uh, a little bit of more green. No, no, You're no, gonna no. take no, away no, all no. the counselor's job. The counselors love those negotiations. Exactly, and we should eliminate that. Counselors should not be negotiating because uh, uh, first I think I would re, I, I think we, we should totally reimagine the role of the counselors. I think the counselors should stop doing any operational issues. I think this is totally crazy that in the GTHA, if they don't pick up your garbage, they call the counselor. If they don't plow the snow, they call the counselor's office. No, no, no. The counselor should focus only on policy and the city staff should focus only on operations. So if they don't pick up your garbage, you call the city staff. You I, was at a speech that Doug, I was at a speech that Doug Ford made, the Premier of Ontario, just two weeks ago, and he, he gave out his cell phone. He says, if you got any problem, you call my cell phone. How stupid, that's totally stupid, that's inefficient. Can you imagine, how could you run a private sector corporation? The, the province of Ontario is, is the largest corporation in Ontario. Can you imagine calling the CEO because they didn't pick up your garbage? That's totally stupid and that's what his brother used to say about Toronto. No one should be calling the councillors. Also, Brian, it's very hard to find really good people to work in the city. Imagine that they called you and they asked you to be in charge of planning or finance or anything. And you have 25 bosses, each one of those councillors or the assistant of the councillor, plus the city manager, plus the mayor as well. I mean, you, you go crazy. Cities like Vancouver, in Vancouver, there no city councillor ever calls a city staff. Council knows that they are for policy and city staff is for operations. So city staff, they don't get into policy, but councillors don't get into operations. It's totally inefficient, the system that we do now. We need councillors. I mean, when they say, I don't like the way that Ford reduced from 44 to 25. I don't like the way he did it, but I'm okay with 25. I think we could even have less than 25. 
if they are going to focus on policy. But if they are going to focus on picking up the garbage of, of everyone, then of course they're, they don't but have the time. And it's not picking up the garbage. It is though, sitting down with every developer and negotiating how many sculptures, how much parking, how much uh, park land, uh, et cetera. And so I do think that there's an incredible amount of involvement that different ward councillors have in almost every development. It's incredible. Exactly. We're going to take a break. And, and also most of those councillors have absolutely no idea of urbanism. So when they sit down with a developer, uh, they, they don't know what they are negotiating. They don't know what they're giving. They're not, they don't know what they're getting. Uh, so it becomes very difficult. Uh, they, they are not trained for that. So 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 I think that it's it not, usually not many good things come out of those negotiations. Uh, I, do think it's, I, I would it's... rather have the city staff sitting down with the developers and also with very clear guidelines, not allowing either one to negotiate much. I think your point is very similar to, to corporate governance, where boards get involved in policy decisions and management does the management and the operations. And I think that uh, boards that get involved in management end up being problematic. And uh, and managers, you know, there's certainly a new trend other than maybe the CEO, but that there aren't a lot of people in management that are on the board. And so the board really truly is independent. And so I think corporate structures uh, are a good guideline for uh, for what you're suggesting, that uh, that that Councils should be like uh, boards and they do policy and uh, and staff should be like management that they do operations management. We're going to take a break for some messages and be back in just two minutes with uh, Gil Penalosa. Stay with us, everybody. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Second and Sixty. A real, real pleasure of mine to uh, meet uh, Gil Penalosa again, who... Uh, who, as I mentioned earlier, I followed for uh, more than a decade now. I think it's been about 15 years. Uh, when did you come and start 8 to 80s and start speaking about urban issues, sir? Well, I created 80 17 years ago. And 880 is a simple but powerful concept. It's what if everything that we did in the city, the sidewalk, the crosswalk, the park, the libraries, the business, the buildings, everything had to be great for an 80-year-old and for an 80, not 8 to 80, but 8 and 80 as an indicator. Because if it's good for the 8 and it's good for the 80, it's going to be good for everybody from zero to over 100. We need to stop building cities as if everybody was 30 year old and athletic. And by the way, uh, Brian, over, over the last 20 years, in, well, I, I came to Canada 23 years ago. In the last 23, I have worked in over 350 cities all over the world in every continent. And uh, but I live in the GTHA. I, I I love it. I think that it's one of the most exciting areas in the world. The GTHA, by the way, is the fastest growing area in the developed world uh, from the point of view of population. They are faster growing, but in emerging countries in Africa and Latin America. But in developed countries, we are growing very fast, and I think that. Uh, that we need to do it right because whatever we do or don't do is where millions and millions of people are going to live for hundreds of years. I interviewed Joe Barrage, who I, I think you know, Urban Strategies, and he was telling me that, Brian, people don't realize that uh, the Greater Toronto Area is going to be the third largest metropolitan area in all of North America within a few years. And we've got to change our attitudes and start realizing that we're, you know, on the uh, on the same plane almost as New York and Los Angeles, uh, greater than Chicago and uh, and Dallas, et cetera. And we got to be planning, think, thinking, um, building, et cetera, uh, as if we are that major metropolitan area. And I think that's an interesting vision that not enough people realize how, how big we're going to become. And also how fast, like Mayor Bloomberg in New York, he, he created a crisis saying we have 8 million people. We are going to grow by 1 million in the next 40 years. If we don't do something about it, we, we are going to collapse. Well, here in the extended GTA from Oshawa to Niagara, we have the same 8 million, except we're not going to grow by one. We're going to grow by 4 million, and not in 40 years, in 30. But nevertheless, there is not a sense of urgency. Like There is not a call to say, hey, we need to know where these 4 million people are going to live. How are they going to move? What kind of schools are they going to have? Libraries, parks? Uh, the aging, we have an aging population. We have doubled the life expectancy in the G in Canada in the last 120 years. But nevertheless, the people, the life over 60 
uh, is not as good as it could be. Like that, that is a real concern that we should be able to live older, healthier, happier. But, but yeah, but from the point of view of population growth, I, I think that we we, we we have not done too much other than what was done like 18 years ago or so by McGinty on the places to grow at. But other than that, there hasn't really been any any call to action, any any vision of where we want to be. Uh, you don't hear from Tori, where does he want Toronto to be five or 10 years from now? Uh, I, I think it's, 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 it's very concerning. Well, we did have the places to grow, grow legislation that you talked about. Um, that uh, talked about expansion. We now uh, have Premier Ford telling each one of the different municipalities how many houses they've got to, uh, new houses they've got to build over the course of the next 10 years uh, to meet that 1.5 million uh, target that's in uh, Bill 23. Uh, you've got the Ontario line um, that uh, wasn't in uh, the big move that Metrolinx announced a couple of years ago, but uh, is sort of the downtown relief line that the big move had and the big move, which uh, was electrification and expansion of Go Transit. So you're not happy with those those efforts? No, no, no. I I I, I think that I, I'm not happy with some things of Ford, like the the green belt. <laughs> I think it's absolutely terrible. But I agree with him on the housing. I think that the the, the mayors and council are complaining to Ford. The reality is that mayors and council have failed terribly in the last twenty years. Sorry, not repeat only, that. Not, mayors, mayors and councilors have failed failed terribly. Uh, doing housing in the last 20 years. Uh, I think and in the case of Toronto, Tory in the last eight, but also Ford and even Miller and, and Lastman. So all of a the sudden there is a crisis and Ford had to come up. So I do think that, that it was good that he came with some targets. Uh, I think that it would be better if he lets the municipality say, okay, you're going to do a million, 1.2 million. You're going to do 500,000. And then let the municipality decide how to do it. So let them, as long as they meet the total amount. I think they, I think the provincial should not get into the details of how many units. As long as they do it within the existing footprint, give him the units and let them do it. But, but I, I agree that that, he, that that he needed to do it. I, I, I support that, that, that. I basically I do support his call to build more housing. Uh, because the cities were not doing it. Uh, then they complained, but but they were not doing it and they are not coming with any proposal on how to do it. Uh, so I agree with that. I, okay. I don't agree, like I mentioned, with the Greenbelt. So I don't about, agree uh, with things such as the Eglinton LRT underground. I think that is a huge waste of money. Brian, can you imagine? There is a train, there is a train, fully designed, the, design, hire, contract. One day, Doug Ford wakes up and says, Oh, what if the LRT on Eglinton, we put it on the round? It's going to cost only 2.4 billion. 2.4 billion. That's a lot of money. Same train, same speed, fewer stops, and it's going to cost 2.4 billion. And what are the civic leaders, what are the elected officials saying in the GTHA? Nothing, nothing. This is the money of everyone. Uh, I mean, I would have said, Mr. Ford, thank you very much for putting more money in public transit, but let's do more kilometers of LRT. Let's not waste it with the same train, same speed that putting it on the ground. Uh, because because I, that, that is an absolutely waste of money. That is that is horrible. So there is the, absolutely no way to justify it. You're an expert in this. Please explain. So, you know, you think about the SkyTrain in Vancouver. It's really an LRT in the sky. Um, the REM uh, in Montreal is an LRT in the sky. My understanding is that if you take an LRT and you elevate it, it costs two times, maybe three times what it costs uh, to build it on surface, but is far more uh, rapid because it's faster than uh, traffic, car traffic, because it's great separated. Uh, but that if you sink it, it's seven times the cost of being on uh, ground. Uh, and so LRTs work, they make sense. And, and if they work in Vancouver and they work in Montreal, one th would think it could work in Toronto. The Neptis Foundation, you know, when was it, 10 years ago, uh, had a major study that said that the Scarborough LRT should be refurbished and uh, rebuilt and extended in a big circle to join up with uh, the Shepherd subway. Why aren't we building Skytrains in Toronto? Why are we building um, some totally subway? Crazy. 
we don't even need them elevated. We can do them on, uh, on grade. But when we do it on grade, we need, we need to give it priority so that as they approach a traffic light, the traffic light, if it's uh, red, it should go green. It should always give green to the LRT. That is, that, that is simple. That, that is obvious democracy. I mean, when you read the constitution, first line says all people are equal. If all people are equal and you have a hundred people on that LRT, why do they have the same priority as one car with one person? No, the LRT, as it approaches intersections, all of the sudden it is a lot cheaper than having it above ground. And also Eglinton West is gigantic. You could fit two, three LRTs at, on the ground. Putting it on the ground is bad for climate change because all of the concrete also is not as nice. If you ask people, if you could go at the same speed above ground or below ground, nine out of 10 people wanna go above ground. You see the sun, you see the trees, the people, the shops. It's good for, it's good for retail because all of a sudden you're gonna have 10, 20, 30,000 people going by and looking at your store. Also people, feel, also people feel safer. It's like, it's like when people take the subway in Toronto and you are, you are going east on the Blue subway. Is everything is dark. As soon as you go above the Don Valley, you can you, you feel everybody kind of having a, 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 a breathing nicer while it goes above above the Don Valley with the sun and the light and whatever. So, but but it, it's a waste of money to have put it underground for nothing. Same train, same speed, fewer stations. Two point four billion is crazy. Tell me, tell me what you think about the Ontario line. I think it's good. I think that we should do it. I think that uh, there, there might be a little bit of discussions on, on, on the specific stops, but but I, I'm concerned that the cost, the cost is, is two and a half times more than the previous subway done in Toronto. So, so they would need to explain why is it that is 250% more. It's, it's, it could be more because everything has gone up, but 250% is way too much, but, but I think it's good. A sizable percentage also, of the... Also, like, now there's a lot of issues with the trees. Uh, of course, I love trees. I love green areas. But but also, I do think that th there has to be a middle ground. It's, uh, I think that Metrolink should be concerned about those 200-year-old trees. But on the other hand, there are some that they need to take down. Yes, we, we need to solve mobility. Uh, because mo mobility and land use is two sides of the same coin. So if we want to have denser cities, we need to have mobility. So, so the, the two of them, we, we have a huge problem. That's why, for example, I think that in Scarborough, we should have that. We had a 21 stop LRT. It's totally crazy. And then we had a mayor saying subway, subway, subways. And we went from 21 station LRT, fully paid by the province, to a one stop subway that then became a three stop subway. So now 13% of the population of Scarborough are gonna have good public transit. 87% are gonna have nothing. With the 21 stop LRT, everybody in Scarborough was gonna have good public transit. Scarborough was gonna be the area of the country of Canada with the best public transit. Those are the things that are unthinkable because with the density that Scarborough has now, or even multiplying by five, the LRT would be more than enough. So putting it on the ground, putting that on the subway is, is a total waste. The 21 stop would have been way better. And again, it's not only the conservatives, it's the liberals. Because the liberals, when Kathleen Wynne was elected, part of, she, she was so concerned that she was gonna lose that she got uh, this woman in Scarborough, Mitzi, uh, Mitzi uh, Hunter, and her promise of doing the subway to get elected. So, but, but the, that political game is not being serious. That, 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 that was total. And you are a business person. You are a very successful business person. Can you imagine, Ryan, investing billions, $7 billion? Never, there had not been one single study comparing the two options, the subway and the LRT, never. Not once. City council under Tory did not allow, did not allow to make a comparison. So the, the city and the province 
embark on this subway without ever making a comparison of options to say, okay, if we have $7 billion, what can we do with $7 billion? I mean, we could have done the 21 stops with 40% of that. We would have the other 60% to do more, but never. It's totally irrational that with, with such amount of taxpayer money that we are investing without even a comparison, a, a comparison study. This all makes a lot of sense. Why aren't people listening to you? Well, some people are listening. When I ran, uh, when I registered, maybe I had a hundred votes. In one hundred days, I got a hundred thousand votes. But, but I don't know. Honestly, Brian, I'm really, I'm very concerned by the lack of civic engagement in the city. For example, that LRT was in Scarborough was going to have a stop in the middle of the campus of University of Toronto Scarborough. He was going to have another stop at Centennial College. But the president of U of T and the president of Centennial never opened their mouth. One day I had lunch with the president of U of T and I, I complained. I said, how come you didn't say anything? And he said, oh, I need to allow my professors to have freedom of speech. No, I said, no, you can let them say whatever they want. I'm telling you as, as, as the responsible for the university, you have almost 15,000 students. They were gonna have a stop in the middle of campus. He says, oh, now it's about two kilometers away. He said, two kilometers away is very far away from the university. It's totally different, the feeling. If those, if the U of T had had an LRT in the middle of campus, that if it has it's two kilometers away. Uh, but, so I don't know. Uh, you know, Ford changes the LRT in Eglinton and it costs 2.4 billion more. And you don't see civic leaders, uh, presence of foundations, uh, you know, uh, civic action, uh, foundations, the newspapers. No one is making a big deal out of it. City councilors ask Tory to send a, a letter to, to, to Premier Ford. Tory got his people to say, no, we don't need that letter. So not even a letter. They did, they did absolutely nothing. I mean, the, the mayor of Mississauga and Brampton and Hamilton also, they said nothing. Why? This is, this is their money too. Well, well, the the 2.4 billion is not only Toronto's money, it's all of Ontario's money. So someone should, but, but there is this politically correctness that I think is crazy. I mean, I love Canada, that's why I live in Canada. But when I took the exam to become Canadian, it didn't say you needed to be politically correct. <laughs> I think people need to be respectful, but one thing is respectful, another thing is politically correct. Why is it that the mayors and councils of all the other cities, they allow for to waste 2.4 billion without saying anything? I, I, think, I think it's irresponsible. That's why I run. We have the gardener, the gardener east. The garden is falling apart. To fix it was gonna cost 500 million. To tear it down and do a boulevard with sidewalks and bikeways and trees and so on, 500 million. Well, Tory went away with the councillors from the suburbs and he comes and says, oh, we're gonna do a hybrid. Yeah, what's a hybrid? It's gonna cost 1.8 billion. So instead of 500 or 500, which were the two options, now it's 1.8 billion. That is $600 per every man, woman, and child in Toronto. That is 44% of the capital budget of Toronto for 10 years, the transportation capital budget. 44%. What, what, the, the Gardner Expressway, the hybrid, is 44% of the capital budget of Toronto for 10 years? Yes. And that is, and, and One the goal is that it's, it's going to save 2% of the commuters, it's going to save three minutes. Best case scenario, best case scenario. That's what Tori says. 2% commuters will save three minutes. And the citywide, everybody's paying 600. I wonder what would have happened if he had gone to any house and knock on the door and say, oh, hello, can you give me $600? Why? Oh, I want to save three minutes to 2% of the commuters. Oh, I see your partner, another $600. Oh, and there is a little kid, another $600. I need $1,800 from you. What? It, it, no one would have accepted, but they approved this, a total political decision. I'm even calling now, let's try to stop. If, right now, if we could stop, we could still save 1 billion and do the boulevard. We could add 8,000 homes 
And also it would be nicer for the city because we would connect the city with the waterfront. Waterfront Toronto is doing amazing work. I think it's one of the entities that is doing the best work. But instead of having an elevator, we would connect the city. So we would have a better, a better solution, 8,000 homes and a million dollars to do other things. But okay, again, this makes so much sense. Why isn't it happening? I, I, I can't believe that the commuters, the 3% of commuters that are going to be better off have got the political club to have this uh, change be put in place. I don't know why is it that the media do, 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 are not making a big issue or the foundations. Uh, you know, when, when I was running for mayor, so many people, even friends, they would say, oh, Gil, you are so much better than Tory. But I mean, they board of a foundation and they give us money and, and he's being the thief. So I said, what? I said, come on, you are above that. Uh, the universities. I asked the universities if I could go and do a keynote, one hour keynote. I said, it's more academic than political. I said, not just me. They said, oh no, we, are, we don't get in each one of your TMU and Toronto. They said, we don't get involved in municipal. I said, I'm, you don't have to get involved. All I need is a room. They would not let me. Uh, but also, so, so I don't know, developers kept saying, oh Gil, you're so much better. But, I don't know, there's so much timidity. I said, it's not about me. The people that are running for, that, that, that probably will run for mayor in four years, they didn't support anybody. Even the so-called progressives, Progress Toronto, they, they supported councillors, but they didn't support anyone for mayor. I said, don't support me. There are 31 people running. I mean, it is what it is. You might not have the ideal, but, but you got 31 people to choose from. But no, these progressive, so-called progressives decided not to support anybody. And now they go and complain. Now they complain that, that Tory is not, is, is not doing anything with the gardener or that Tory is not doing with the homeless or that Tory this. Well, they had a chance. At least they, 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 were, they, they would have more credibility, more integrity if they had supported any one of the 31 candidates. Gil Penalosa. Fascinating conversation. We're going to take a break for some messages and be back in just two minutes with Gil with some concluding comments. Stay with us, everyone. Really interesting. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Gil Penalosa, who uh, is uh, is the founder of an organization called uh, Eight. Uh, and I, I thought it was Eight Two Eighty. It's not. It's Eight Eight Eighty Cities. 880 citizens and uh and it's it's all about uh, cities building cities that are good for eight-year-olds as well as 80-year-olds uh he's an urban affairs uh, uh critic and speaker an inspirational speaker he's traveled the world uh talking to different cities about how to build and he ran for mayor uh a year ago or six months ago four months ago i guess and uh and got a hundred thousand votes uh pretty impressive in just 100 days of campaigning um gil i gotta ask you uh about uh, the way that the greater toronto uh, Hamilton area works. Um, you know, you talk about how this uh, 8 million uh, um, area is going to become uh, 12 million over the course of the next 30 years. It's going to grow fairly dramatically. Uh, we've got uh, one sizable city, the city of Toronto, and then 29 other cities uh, that are around it. Um, back in 1996, there was a thing called uh, the GTA a study that uh, was done by, I think it was Ann Golden, uh, who did a study and she recommended uh, creating five cities and having those five cities join in a new to, new GTA council, like Metro Council. So in other words, amalgamate Peel into one city, Alton into one city, York into one city, Durham into one city. Does that make any sense? Or what we've got from uh, some current uh, mayors is they want every city to separate and become a one-tier uh, municipality by itself and get rid of uh, regional government. What do you think the solution is to governance in, uh, in the greater Toronto Hamilton area? Well, I would not be surprised if Ford comes up with a solution similar to the one you mentioned of Van Golden and creating some uh, large mega cities. So like instead of having Burlington and Oakville and Milton and Holton Hills, would have be the city of Holton. Uh, even Mississauga would, might be merged with uh, Brampton and Caledon. Uh, but but what I think is important is that we need to realize that we are in this together because there has to be some basic guidelines for the whole area. One, environmentally, everything, we're the same. So the waters go from one city to another. People live in one city, they work in another, they are, their children go to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or another. So, so we're totally interlinked. 
but we have done a really poor job integrating. For example, if you are in Oakville and you want to come to Toronto, you need to take one Oakville bus and transfer to a Mississauga bus and transfer to a Toronto bus. We don't even have an, a, a, a bus rapid transit that would go on Dundas from one end to the other. Well, so, and one of my frustrations is I would take a Mississauga bus uh, to a, uh, a provincially owned Go Transit train and then get on the TTC and pay three different uh, fares. Exactly. Th those kind of things we need to integrate. And it's simple. For example, you, you see places like Copenhagen and Malmo. Malmo in Sweden, Copenhagen in Denmark. Two countries, two different languages, two different currencies. And you have one transportation car that you can go into either, con either city. Uh, and there is a train going in between. You can take in any city, taxis, um, bike share system, uh, you over uh, trains, <laughs> boats, anything with the same card. Why is it that even here with Mississauga, we cannot use the same card and Toronto? So we, we need to work. Issues such as density. We need to work, for example, Mississauga is urgent that Mississauga allows people to subdivide their homes. There are many areas of Mississauga that were developed at the same time. So now the children grow and now the children are living. So in many of those areas, they are running out of children. Uh, so the parks are becoming empty, the community centers, the libraries, the schools, they need families. So, so we need to work on that. By the way, I, I, I think Mississauga could have been the nicest city in Canada. 40 years ago, Mississauga had 250,000 people in about six or seven nice villages, Port Credit, Clarkson, uh, Streetsville, and so on. Everything else was farms with a beautiful river through the middle and, and creeks and lake. It could have been a city with greenways going east, west, and north, south, with an amazing public transit, with walkability, whatever. But the, unfortunately, it was built 100% about car, 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 and didn't really think about how to make it sustainable. That, that, that was unfortunate. I think we should learn from that and not do the same things, which is what we are doing in Milton and in Brampton. We need to rethink how, how we're growing. So, so I think we should learn from each other. We should learn from the experiences. When I was talking with the planners of Oakville and I said, what is the best part of Oakville? And I said, oh, Gil, you gotta come. You gotta see the downtown. I said, no, I know the downtown, You're, but that was built a hundred years ago. The only credit that you have is that you didn't mess it up. Uh, <laughs> but that downtown was nice when Oakville had 40,000 people. Now you have over 200,000. Why is it that you have not done five or six of those downtowns throughout Oakville and you left only one? I have friends that live in the north side of Oakville and they drive down to the Lakeshore to the Starbucks on Lakeshore. And they go past two or three Starbucks along the road because they want to park and they want to walk on the main street of, of, of Oakville downtown. They should have done that all over the place. Uh, I mean, they have these places like Trafalgar with all public, Sheridan College, City Hall, whatever. All of these gigantic parking lots facing Trafalgar when it could have been done totally different. So I do think that, that, that the GTSA, we, we still have a lot of foundations to do to be spectacular. I mean, we, we, we are the most diverse but also not the most integrated. We have a big problem of integration in all the cities, whether it is uh, Toronto or Mississauga or Oakville. Uh, cities like Toronto or Mississauga where more than half of the population are visible minorities. You don't find visible minorities in the top 10 positions. Uh, we, I'm not saying that it has to be 50-50, but why is it that a city like Toronto Everybody in the top, the, the city manager, the three deputy managers, the head of planning, transportation, parks, the police, all white. All white. Couldn't they have found one? I mean, this is, this is a time bomb that we must defuse before this explodes. But nevertheless, we are from all over the world. I think we have magnificent ravines. Toronto, 17% of the area of Toronto are ravines. But I also, I have run and walked and biked all of the ravines in Mississauga. I love them. The Credit River is fantastic. For but example, they're not connected, which is a real problem. I think it's a real shame that they're not connected and they're interrupted exactly. by private golf courses and things like that. Gil, I got asked. No, no, for example, question. the golf courses, you, you should be able to connect Streetsville to Port Credit. There is only a little bit of places like in the golf courses 
Come on, let's put it on the golf course. If they don't let you, okay, put it on top of the Pretty River. You go to you go to places like Minneapolis where there was private property. Well, they put the trail on the Mississippi River for half a kilometer here, another half a kilometer there on the river. On but the river. I have also seen in Washington that they put it through the golf course with a screen around so that people won't get hit with balls or whatever. But I mean, it's an issue of negotiation, but it would be it would be magnificent. The, one of the best natural features of the GTHA to have a linear park from Streetsville to Port Credit, uninterrupted, without any streets. It would be so easy. 80% is already done. Gil, I got one minute. Would, I, I got one minute left. I got to ask you one last uh, very uh, provocative question. What do you think about this strong mayor? I think we don't need it. I think the mayors are extremely strong. I haven't seen in the last 20 years in Toronto any one vote that Lastman or Miller or Ford or Tory had lost on anything that is that was relevant to them. Nothing. Tory has not lost any. We had a weak mayor is because we, 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 we lacked vision not powers. He had the powers. He won every single vote in the last eight years. Everything that I've been talking about doing in the city, he could have easily done it with the capacity that he had. He had an overwhelming majority. And I think that also in Mrs. Saga, Bonnie Crombie, and in Brampton, Brown, and, and now in Hamilton, and so I think they can approve. That's, that's a huge myth that we didn't have a, a, a strong mayor. We have them, but this is not, not giving mayoral powers. What Ford is doing is taking the power away from the citizens to the council, from the council to the mayor, and from the mayor to the premier. He wants to be the mayor of everybody because they get the power if and only if it aligns with his provincial goals. So at the end of the day, he is making the final decisions. If it doesn't align with the provincial goals, they cannot take advantage of any of the mayoral powers. Gil that is dangerous and that is bad. Gil Penalosa, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Some very provocative ideas. Brian, thank you very much for inviting me. Have a wonderful That's our, show. That's our show for tonight, everybody. Thanks for joining us.